Good afternoon and uh, welcome to all those who have uh, joined us today for our monthly Okanagan School of Business Speaker Series. I'm Dan Rogers, the Executive Director for the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce and delighted to have you with us today and delighted to have a number of local media experts who have joined us. We're excited to jump into a conversation with them today about the media's role in the age of a pandemic and how the media from a business perspective is making out uh, from a local perspective uh, as we all face COVID-19 and it seems everything related to, to COVID-19. Though we do have some political issues to pay attention to as well. We're also joined by the Chamber's President, Jeff Robinson, and the Dean of the Okanagan School of Business, uh, Bill Gillett. I will uh, turn things over to them in a moment. But first, I want to recognize uh, that we are gathered today, most of us at least, on the unceded territory of the Silic Okanagan people. We thank them for their rich heritage and uh, for their continued involvement uh, in our community as we work together for economic prosperity for all. Um, a couple of housekeeping items off the top of uh, the session today. Uh, we are recording today's session and it will be posted on the Chamber's YouTube channel a bit later today so others can review the discussion. I also assume uh, that many of you are now somewhat familiar with uh, the Zoom functions. We have a Q&A function at the bottom of your menu, so you can use that to pose a question, or you can use the chat function that will come through as we get towards the end of our hour-long session. Uh, we will get to as many uh, questions that arise, and I will facilitate that as we move through. Uh, we, once we get through the opening remarks, I will facilitate that. We are uh, looking to conclude around one o'clock. Also want to remind those that have joined us today that the Chambers in the Okanagan Valley have come together and formed a coalition to help our members and in fact the entire business community throughout the Valley to better access information and resources in the face of the pandemic. Okanagan We Got This is the banner in which we've put that together. You can find information at okanaganwegotthis.com. That includes uh, celebrating some success stories of resiliency by business in the entire Okanagan Valley. And I also want to acknowledge the partnership we have with RBC and the Canadian Chamber in the Canada United Show Local Some Love um, initiatives that are also available on that particular website. This year we uh, are holding our Business Excellence Awards, though it will be a little different. We're gonna celebrate the resiliency within our great city and region. Nominations for each of the awards have been selected. The nomination packages are due back to us by Friday, October 2nd. So watch your inboxes to see if you've been nominated. And it will be, yes, a virtual awards program in November. More details to come. On October 21st, the Chamber welcomes Michael Denham, uh, the President and CEO with BDC, will be joining us on October 21st. That's during Small Business Week in Canada. We'll discuss the state of small business in our country, the various programs available to help small businesses and organizations, and also learn a bit about how BDC is responding to the challenges to ensure businesses can weather the storm and come through it and be successful and globally competitive on the other side. Also in October, our next speaker series will be held in late October, which is of course, Disability Employment Awareness Month, among other things. Acquiring and retaining labor has been identified as an issue for our region, our city, and we'll be engaging a couple of experts in that realm that can help us understand the benefits and the barriers that need to be considered when hiring someone with a disability. Please stay tuned for more information on that session on October 27th. It's a great opportunity to learn how to tap into an underutilized labor force while building a more inclusive and positive work environment. And please stay tuned to our newsletter and social media as we're announcing more exciting events as part of Business Smart Series throughout October, as well as uh, several forums on the upcoming election. And uh, just as I suspect you've shared with others, information is available on Election BC. In fact, you can already, and I know some have, request your mail-in package. So you can go on Election BC website and do that so you can get your ballot, so you can mail it in 
or do it the old fashioned way and show up in person. Did want to note, uh, we'll be working with our colleagues uh, through the central Okanagan at least in putting on all candidate forms in Kelowna Lake Country, Kelowna West, and Kelowna Mission, all three ridings we will cover off and working with our partners to at least bring some information to you about to the backgrounds, the goals of the uh, local candidates uh, once that list is all finalized and we're tuning into our media to find out who all the candidates will be as time passes by. Uh, I quickly wanted to acknowledge our President Circle members, BDO, UBC Okanagan, MNP, LLP, and Interior Savings. We're also extremely pleased to recognize our newest President Circle member, Rogers Communications, is joined as one of our foundational partners here at the Chamber. We look forward to building our relationship with them as they grow their business in Kelowna and the Okanagan, much of which is centered on providing technology and resources that can support and accelerate the pace of business in Kelowna and region. Also thanks to TD Benefits and the Chamber Group Insurance, our partners throughout the year, providing the number one employee extended healthcare benefit program in Canada. If you want to explore this program and what it could mean to your business, or your team, just give us a shout here at the Chamber. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce Bill Gillett from Okanagan College, uh, who is joining us and is gonna provide a few words uh, uh, to kick things off today. Bill. Uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, I'll keep it to a few words today. As you know, we are, as always, privileged to uh, be able to sponsor this series. It's been a very important series directed to the business community in Kelowna. Uh, the college, as we usually give a little bit of an update, things are, are off to a very good start for the new semester. Uh, one of the things that we are looking forward, looking forward to enjoying this year we have added helicopters to our commercial aviation program. So we see continued expansion of the programs and looking to what we see as the needs of the business community in the region. Uh, with respect to this program, we are, as, as I said, delighted to be able to sponsor it. As we look around the world, going beyond business itself, uh, we see how important it is for functioning democracies to have an informed populace and the media is the key uh, point of that in terms of what we do. So thank you to the panelists for joining us today and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Bill. And uh, given your uh, roots in the U.S., I'm almost tempted to ask you, so what are you hearing uh, from your friends, col former colleagues in the U.S.? But I won't, uh, but we will have that subject and perhaps uh, another day we'll, we'll have that discussion. Bill, thanks very much for joining us. At this time, I uh, want to turn things over to um, our uh, sponsor today. Clayton uh, Richard uh, has joined us from uh, RBC, the Senior Commercial Account Manager, to say a few words. As mentioned, we've partnered with RBC in their national initiative around United Canada. Uh, Clayton, it's great to have you with us. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, and thanks to RBC for not only their partnership in making today's event possible, but also your support throughout the year. Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to support this great event to help keep the business community connected. Like I said, at RBC, we take pride in supporting the business community with creative solutions to continue to move forward through these interesting, interesting times. With a strong commercial presence led by Vice President Ray Warren and with our, commercial, our, our team of relationship managers located in Penticton, Kelowna, and Vernon, we're committed to helping businesses stay connected and supported. As with that focus, RBC will continue, on, continue to build winning relationships and helping communities grow for years to come. I would like to touch on a couple community initiatives RBC has on the go both nationally and locally. As Dan noted, the Canada United project. I would ask you to take a few minutes and go visit the gocanadaunited.ca website. RBC recently announced the Canada United Project, the national movement that RBC is leading to bring together more than 70, 70 of Canada's leading brands, the National Chamber of Commerce Network, and the Canadian Business Associations to support all local businesses across Canada. From retailers and restaurants to local service providers, automotive shops and tradespeople, supporting local business has never been more important to moving Canada's recovery forward. Canada United gives every Canadian a chance to show their support through actions big and small. We hope to see more events, as Dan noted, the Shop Local Weekend in August. We hope to see more of these events occur 
on in the near future. On the website for businesses, there's a lot of great opportunities and, and materials. I would suggest on the taking a look at the small business toolkit. There's marketing materials, both electronic and paper-based, that include COVID messaging signage uh, for print and display, as well as there's the Small Business Relief Fund that is supporting businesses with $5,000 grants for PPEs and improvements to the business to meet the current requirements. I do note that the BC applications are full at this time, and we hope to see some local businesses benefit from this program. Locally, other community initiatives, with the amazing employees at RBC, we're continually we are continually working to support local events and organizations. As you many of you are aware, due to COVID, many organizations have been impacted and RBCers are working to find creative ways to, sh to show our so local support. I would like to mention the Ray Needs a Razor event, where Ray Warren, our Vice President, has grown his hair and beard since the quarantine started and will shave it all off tomorrow to support the local Okanagan Boys and Girls Club. There was a great write-up on last week's, in last week's Kelowna Now website in Maxine DeHart's editorial, noting Ray Warren's commitment to help this organization. There's a link in the article to donate before the tomorrow's event. Uh, we are working to reach a goal of $10,000. And if that goal is, is met, Ray will shave only half his head and beard for 24 hours to support this great cause. I don't know how we convinced them to do it, but we did. So thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of today's event. And I know we're all looking forward to hearing from the panelists. Thank you again. And thank you uh, very much, Clayton, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing uh, what Ray looks like tomorrow. Uh, I know he's got lots up top. I didn't realize he had much down uh, around his chin. So we'll, we'll take a good look at that tomorrow. So thanks very much. And, and thanks for the work uh, you and RBC do on a regular basis. Uh, before uh, turning things over to the panelists, I want to... Uh, turn things uh, over to our president and chair of the board, Jeff Robinson, who has also joined us uh, to kick things off this morning. Jeff? Thanks, Dan. Before I introduce our panelists today, I want to recognize our local elected leaders who are joining us. As the voice of business in Kelowna, it's great to have a productive and positive relationship with those who represent us in government. And so today we have with us our member of parliament, Tracy Gray, and also Steve Thompson, our MLA for Kelowna Mission. I'd like to give, give Steve a special thank you. Uh, I understand his term as our MLA will be coming to an end with the SNAP election. Uh, Steve has been for many years a stalwart voice for Kelowna in business, um, a very credible member of our Legislative Assembly, and we've been very fortunate to have his service. I also want to acknowledge that we have with us a number of Chamber of, of Commerce uh, board members. Uh, Dan Price will be joining us later to say thanks. Uh, also, we have Ron Cannon from Interior Savings and Ellen Bolke from Kelowna Community Resources. Thank you all for joining us. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we're fortunate to have panelists uh, who are probably well known to most of you. Uh, first up is Chris Walker. He's the current host of Daybreak South right here in Kelowna. Uh, and uh, started his proper journalism career as a freelance reporter in the Middle East. Uh, he's also worked at the C CBC as a jack of all trades since 2002. Chris has a master's degree in journalism from Carleton University and of course a much deeper education in life from his work as a, as a radio host. Uh, our second panelist to be introduced is Doris Bregolisi from Global Okanagan. Uh, Doris is an accomplished radio, print and TV journalist. She joined Global Okanagan in 2004 and she's the current lead evening anchor. She is the first woman to achieve that role in the station's 63-year history. She enjoys spending time with her family and loves an active life in the Okanagan Valley, much like the rest of us. Third, we have Chris Olson from Peak Communicators. Chris is a Canadian reporter with 30 years in the radio and television industry. He was also the press secretary to Premier Christy Clark. Most of us know Chris from his Olson on Your Side series, where he helped thousands of consumers make better decisions in their lives. He is now the Vice President for Peak Communications. And finally, we have Cam McAlpin. Cam is a principal of Earnscliffe Strategy Group, a leading national communications, public affairs, and research organization. organization pardon me. Prior to entering public relations, Cam worked as a journalist for 10 years. And so I hope we're all excited, uh, as I am, uh, to hear our panelists speak today. Thanks, Dan. 
Thanks very much, Jeff, uh, for that introduction. I'm going to bring in our four uh, uh, guests that uh, have joined us now and want to thank them. Uh, I will say on the offset, two quick things. One, uh, as we're not funded by government, we have to do the promotion in advance. That's one of the changes we had to do when we shifted from luncheons that were live to this uh, type of venue because people left. <laughs> They, they logged out right after the content. So uh, we have to pay the bill. So thanks uh, for all your patience to get to this stage. Um, and the second piece, when we were looking at this, we, the first initial conversation we had is uh, there's some uh, reporters that cover the legislature. We thought we'd go there and then we quickly realized, why do we need to go to Victoria or Vancouver? We got some expertise in our own backyard uh, from the journalists that are working on a regular basis. And thanks to Doris and Chris for joining us. And then also with Chris Olson and Cam McAlpine, uh, particularly Cam, you work for a national organization, but you managed to convince them that you don't need to be anywhere but in the Okanagan to do your job. So thanks to, to both of you for joining us. What I want to start things off is just a quick introduction, a kind of a perspective uh, for about a minute or so. Doris, we're going to start with you. Uh, just your thoughts generally about how challenging it has been um, representing your organization, covering uh, uh, the news and events uh, during uh, COVID-19 and any general observations you would make. Thank you, Dan. Uh, welcome to the world of unfake news because that's when the, one of the biggest challenges is maintaining our credibility. And we've had a long history here in the Okanagan Global Okanagan, as you mentioned, 63 years as a business in this community. I've lived in this community for 28 years as a journalist as well. And the challenges now, we never imagined being challenged simply based on our authority as journalists and looking for the truth. So the challenge of covering a pandemic has been the great amount of misinformation, not only about the subject itself, but about us as message um, delivery people. So the impact on business has been felt by us as well. We have had challenges in the last six months of losing revenue. And fortunately we are owned by a Canadian company that is dedicated to supporting locally covered news. And they continue to support us, even though revenues locally and nationally are down, but things are looking up, which is encouraging. Uh, Facing the social media dilemma, as everybody's been talking about these days, uh, losing our, um, our, our voice to the many on social uh, media, trying to find footing in, in giving people balance between the facts and fiction. So challenges of covering the pandemic in television include logistics. Uh, we've been shamed for looking like we're not social distancing, uh, just like everybody else out there. People concerned about how close we are to each other as our work environment uh, on a desk, an anchor desk, or being out in the public with a long stick and a microphone. So logistics, uh, business-wise advertising dollars, and simply being uh, considered trustworthy continuously here in the local community. Well, thank, thanks, Doris, for the, uh, those comments. Uh, we have a number of issues uh, that you mentioned. We want to do a little deeper dive, including, um, you know, one of the things that we're hearing, well, we certainly have heard it in the U.S., but also now in Canada. Should there be revenue flowing from, as an example, Facebook to help, uh, you know, bring some revenue back to local and uh, small um, uh, broadcast and, and journalism organizations, uh, focused organizations in Canada. I'm going to go to the other uh, journalist uh, slash host uh, that's on the air, Chris Walker. Chris, thanks for joining us. Uh, your uh, general thoughts uh, and challenges of being on the air on a regular basis in light of COVID-19, has it changed from your perspective? Well, yeah. I mean, of course it's changed. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, essentially the you know, the principles of our work haven't changed. In fact, they've been reinforced in a lot of ways. But, you know, just like Doris was saying, that the, the logistics have changed, uh, you know, working from home, getting new technology, adapting our old technology. Uh, you know, luckily, I work, as I'm sure Doris does, with a, a lot of smart people who, uh, you know, are very flexible and have been able to 
adapt pretty well. Um, I know we're going to talk more about some of the editorial challenges. Uh, uh, yesterday, this time, we had a protest outside our office, a fake news protest. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and, you know, I haven't had a haircut in <laughs> six months, so that's a problem. Um, but, you know, I think really media is facing very similar challenges to everybody else, which is, you know, this, this pandemic affects people in different ways. You know, we have younger journalists who uh, are just learning the ropes. They've had to suddenly, you know, go away from mentors who have been here for longer. Uh, people are in different financial situations. You know, so from that sort of HR perspective, uh, media and editorial aside, yeah, it's been a challenge, but I think we're, we're all getting used to this, aren't we? Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm going to switch to the other Chris now, and, and Chris Olson, I'm going to bring you in. Uh, you know, Chris, with your client base and those that you're dealing mm -hmm. with, uh, have you made some adjustments uh, and given different advice to them of how they get their message across uh, when everything's clearly focused on COVID-19? How's it impacted you and your organization? Well, certainly things uh, changed. Uh, thanks, Dan. The, uh, I would say, you know, if I had to pick a date, it was uh, March 13th. Uh, we had 40 projects on the go and they all stopped. Uh, you know, I'm sure many businesses watching would say, hey, same thing happened to us. And uh, uh, basically because a lot of businesses were sorting out what their future was really going to be. And I can say that... Um, Starting in about June, July, things started picking up again, and uh, we've actually had no problem getting coverage for our clients. And this may come as a real surprise to other people, but really, uh, in 30 years in the media, and I was also assignment editor at uh, CTV for a couple of those years, media is always looking for good stories. And there's always going to be some big news dominating the news. Uh, we now have an election. That's pushed COVID-19 down a notch, yet we're still going to have COVID-19 news. So the key is really uh, knowing that in order to get the media to do your story, you have to provide news. It has to be a benefit to their viewers and listeners and, uh, and readers. And I think that that's, uh, that challenge hasn't changed. So I think a lot of people saw the headlines, saw everything is COVID and decided they couldn't get coverage. And I can tell you that that's uh, not true these days. Uh, that you can get coverage if you have a really good story to tell. And I wanted to congratulate, by the way, our media people that are here for, and the politicians that might be viewing uh, for not politicizing this pandemic, as we've seen in the United States. We've all kind of worked together um, on uh, dealing with the virus. And I think that's a tribute to the politicians and the media as well. It would have been very easy to make this just another political issue, and that hasn't happened. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. And finally, to Cam McAlpine. Cam, uh, thanks for joining us. Some, some general thoughts and observations from you uh, working out of the Okanagan with a large organization and a pretty good client base. Adjustments? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, and, and Chris, I also haven't had a haircut in six months. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll maybe refer to the, the last six months in, in three phases. What I, um, what I call phase one, two, and three. Phase one being the, the March 13th date that, uh, that Chris referred to. Uh, I was actually uh, trying to find my way back from Cuba uh, on on those dates and uh, landed in Kelowna on March 16th when our when our Vancouver office uh, uh, evacuated and, and everybody went home. Um, what I would say is that first I, I would call phase one month one. So so March it was all COVID all the time. And this is these are my observations uh, of the media from from the outside. Um, it was, it was all COVID all the time for that first month. Uh, frankly, our clients weren't concerned with getting in the media at the time anyways, um, but our advice to them was don't even bother. Uh, it's, it's not the time anyways. Um, you know, people have a lot of, uh, a lot more important concerns. Um, so, you know, pitching uh, business stories to the media at that time was, well, it would have been seen as pretty tone deaf anyways. Uh, phase two, Kind of April to June, I would call it, is uh, where where media was interpreting everything through a COVID lens. Um, so 
COVID was still the top story. Um, during that period, we started to see the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but that's a good example of how things were interpreted through a, a COVID lens, right? People talked about these protests, but they talked about the fact that people weren't wearing masks. Um, the, uh, during, during that term, when, you know, if, if people wanted to engage with the media, the advice was really, uh, you need to find a way in, you need to, to find a way for the media to be interested in your story. And of course, if you can find a COVID uh, hook into the story, then that's, that's your best avenue. Um, so that, you know, that's where you started to see lots of stories about PPE, you know, um, all the local distilleries doing their hand wash, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, and then phase three uh, is what I would call sort of the re-engagement phase, kind of July through to, to the current date, um, which is especially locally, uh, which I'm happy to see there is significantly more diverse coverage of all the stuff that we're used to seeing, uh, you know, whether it be the, the election, whether it be sort of local crimes and misdemeanors, uh, the, the, the issues at the local level in Kelowna, um, and, and we're back, what I would suggest is at a, a little bit more of a, a normal um, stage. We'll see if that uh, continues given that we've got the provincial election going on and, and of course phase two of, of COVID as the Prime Minister pointed out last night. Great, thanks Cam. Um, I'm gonna shift gears now um, and thanks for all of you for joining us. I'm gonna put a few things on the table, but before getting there, uh, I do wanna let those that have joined us, if you wanna ask a question, you have great access to uh, two of our leading journalists uh, that are regularly on the airwaves uh, in Chris and Doris. And you have some expertise in communications between Chris and Cam. And my motivation, even at the chamber, is if I can get some free advice out of these two guys, then I might take it today. So I might leak in a, a question or two. So thanks uh, for both of you. But feel free to use the Q&A function. We'll get to those. Ask them at any time, and I'll make sure I monitor that on an ongoing basis. I want to talk uh, and put on the table and you can jump in and make comments as you, um, you like between the, our four panelists with respect to the role of the media and uh, whether in your perspective it changed or should change or had to change. And I, I'll illustrate this um, by something interestingly enough. I think, Chris, you'd be familiar in our discussion. The Chamber sent out a letter to the two premiers some time ago saying, when both of you get to phase three, can you both have a conversation around um, creating a, a, a bubble zone between the two provinces? They're currently at different stages. So the business we're in is making suggestions around policy, not necessarily whether that will, respecting those have to make the policy. But uh, I know, Chris, we had a fair bit of discussion around this. It, it struck me afterwards that, do we still have a platforms available to have broad discussions of different approaches to this? Or do we need, or do you need to be, and are you cautious of, uh, people may not know when they're tuning into a newscast versus listening to a, a columnist uh, or a, a host on a show that might be speculating, or a guest that might be speculating, because we're all flooded with information. How does the consumer, the, you know, the resident in the uh, Kelowna or Okanagan, how do they grapple with, you know, getting what the definitive answer is in understanding, or do they? You think, you know, maybe I'm underestimating people that they are actually observing. Does, does that role change where you, you need to maybe tighten that up? And Chris, maybe I'll start with you, uh, Walker, uh, from CBC's perspective, because it's nice to have a forum, and you have that quite often on your morning show, have broad discussions, but uh, also you, you want to be sensitive. You don't want to send mixed messages because there's, Lots of different things out there in the marketplace. Well, I think you've touched on a couple of issues, um, one which is new and one which is not. Um, and I'll start with the one which is not new, which is that sometimes the line between um, editorializing or opinion or analysis and pure news reporting is blurry. Uh, it shouldn't be blurry, in, in my view. It, um, and but it because journalism budgets have shrunk and because we live in a more polarized world uh those two things have worked together to make it sometimes not clear um you know if you have a reporter for a newspaper who's the only local reporter well who's going to write the editorial that week turns out that reporter now that to me is a is a problem 
sort of from a theoretical perspective. Um, uh, so that's always been a bit of a tension in journalism. And, you know, uh, in, in our case, um, sure, we have guests on the air who will, will provide various points of view. Now, it would be impossible for us to jump in and say at every turn, that's not the position of the CBC or what have you. Um, so that's, that's a one and, and continuing, maybe a problem that's getting a little bit uh, worse in terms of that blend of analysis and opinion with pure news reporting. The second thing you raised is, um, you know, sh the difference of opinions or difference of the interpretation of facts from a, in a, from a medical and scientific perspective. And that is something that all journalists are suddenly becoming very familiar with. And um, I don't think it's the role of, of, of journalists to, um, to, uh, to elevate one medical opinion over another, but to present those and let the experts have that conversation between themselves. So, you know, uh, when it comes to broad public policy, like a travel bubble, that's something that I think is, is fair game. But if, but the underlying medical advice, the scientific advice, the public health advice, the epidemiology that goes into that discussion really isn't up for debate, I don't think. Um, uh, so at least certainly not between journalists or, uh, you know, uh, so there, you know, there, this is not a perfect, there, there, are, there are not good and like there are not uh, right and wrong answers here. It's every, literally every moment on the air, every time you make an editorial decision, these things come up and, and, uh, and you do the best you can. Um, it's not perfect. And, and I mean, when we get into a, the discussion a little bit more, we can talk more about maybe why it's not perfect. But. Yeah. Doris, from, from your perspective, do you reflect more uh, about messaging and, you know, double checking because, you know, people want to get, um, you know, really now more than ever, almost, uh, you know, reliable sources of information and when you're hosting, you know, the, the daily newscast, are you, are you hypersensitive to that? Does that influence you? You know, that's, that's, a, that's always been a problem is to try and stay the course. Stay the course in what we do, uh, maintain integrity, uh, look for the truth. That is something that even, you know, I told a friend last year who was walking through a difficult time in her life, uh, do it with grace, be strong and stick to your mandate. And that's what we as local journalists, who, as I mentioned, you know, have been called the fake news. So stand tall, stick to your principles. Um, and, you know, there are times, there are, there are times that I've seen a story where I would love to roll my eyes and give opinion. I would love to, you know, make my own comment about a story. I stay the course. I'm a human being, as all journalists are, and I do have mixed emotions about the information that I'm giving. But as Chris pointed out, uh, we have we have to bring the stories with balanced opinion, and and not just the constant same scientific opinion. Let's source out, and it would be great if we had more people in our community who did reach out to us and say, "This is my expertise." If you ever have a story that needs an opinion, I would be there for you. And especially nowadays where we never had this kind of connection with our community virtually, uh, it was difficult to get people in front of a camera. Now everybody has to in some way be in front of the camera. And if we had more local voices that we knew, and I know we have a vast, you know, uh, array of different topics that people are experts on right here in the Okanagan in our own backyard. I would like to hear more from them. And if they reach out to us and we can, again, have that as an availability, that would be amazing. And I do welcome uh, people who have an expertise that we would look into that and have your opinion because these are local voices about global opinions that, that we need to hear about. 
I'll shift to Chris Olson. Uh, Chris, given, you know, I'm assuming, I shouldn't jump to that assumption, that you monitor media for the many years you've been, uh, and how you've been involved in communication. Uh, has the media generally uh, faced a tougher challenge when, when you were actively involved? I suspect this is the, most, uh, the first pandemic for most of us. Uh, I don't know how many were around for the Spanish flu, but... Uh, this, this is a, a unique situation when you observe the media, is, is the job tougher when you think about and reflect on your career? Well, first off, to me, in, in general terms, so everybody watching can kind of get, get my sense of it, uh, a, a pandemic is a lot like a natural disaster. And uh, the most important thing is getting the information that people need right now to all of them. And it has to be accurate information, which only the local media who follow ethical practices and do the research and as uh, Doris alluded to, uh, you know, vet the people that they talk to and use as experts. Um, that, that's really a vital role. Then as, you know, the, the pandemic uh, goes along, of course, the, you know, the role expands. I mean, I, I think a lot of the uh, difficulty from the media um, was, you know, the social distancing, uh, especially for television, um, is is a problem, you know, but I think they've done a really good job. And when Doris mentioned about how people uh, criticize them, you're not practicing social media, uh, social distancing, because they don't see how far back you are and this sort of thing. It appears you're right there. Um, we had that at, at CTV once with our helicopter uh, live on a newscast shooting a boy and a dog hanging off a cliff. And people uh, were calling the station saying, your, your helicopter is going to blow them off the cliff. We were three miles away. And so we had to do this several times in the newscast, pull back to show this is what your naked eye could see if you, you know, from our helicopter position. And he couldn't even see the cliff. He saw trees and a little speck. So uh, people overreact to things. And the other thing I think you, you might find interesting, we did a survey once that found that 10% of our viewers thought the news they were watching at six, the entire newscast was live and happening right then. It's kind of a miracle we are in all these <laughs> places to uh, shoot the news in. So I think the real role in a pandemic for the media, and it's been very important that they've done an outstanding job, is to get that accurate information uh, to the public and not go the route of uh, politicizing it, not uh, giving credence to conspiracy theory du jour, um, not uh, hounding the politicians and the medical experts to say, you're not telling us the full story, you're getting things wrong, you said masks aren't good, now you say to wear a mask, and highlighting those things that divide us. I think they've done a really good job of, uh, of making sure that uh, they're part of the solution and not part of the problem. So if I could build on that to, to Cam McAlpine, you know, one of the things uh, Chris and, and I think the others have, have commented on, uh, people need to be aware because they're flooded with information, that source of that information, um, you know, I uh, often, well, how did you know that? Well, I Googled it. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably not the best source of information, just a Google search, but when you're dealing with clients, is there good knowledge of the media or is there, I often think, you know, we should educate our youth a little bit more of sources of media and understanding journalist integrity and, and qualifications, et cetera, so you can have a bit of a filter in where it's all coming from because we're flooded a bit. Do you find with your clients that they understand the media or, or do you have to do a little bit of that education? We have to do a lot of that education, yeah. I, I think it's the case with with just the general populace in, in general. Media literacy is uh, is declining. Um, you know, there's various uh, organizations trying to improve it. Um, before I get into that, though, Dan, I just I, Chris got to tell a story, so I'll, I'll tell a story that you'll appreciate. Um, our our friend Cheryl Jan, who's a, a reporter at PGTV up in Prince George. Uh, in the early days of COVID, when, when they were still trying to figure out how to do these interviews uh, with masks, without masks, how do you, how do you get close to someone doing a TV interview? Uh, there was a photo that circulated on social media. Her, uh, her solution was a very Canadian one. She, she had got a lacrosse stick, put a, put a microphone on the end of the lacrosse stick and, and held the lacrosse stick out to her interview subjects. It was, uh, 
Yeah, it was very classic. Um, so there, there's one solution. Um, what, what I would say is um, there's, a, there's, a famous, uh, there's a famous saying in the world of journalism, and I'll probably butcher it, but um, essentially they say journalism is, is the first draft of history, uh, which means, of course, the journalists are covering the news today uh, what, that will then be studied in, in future days. Um, and, and so the, the journalists, particularly in Canada, um, the U.S., is, as Chris pointed out earlier, is a, is a unique animal, um, but particularly in Canada, and, and I would say particularly locally, they're doing their jobs, they're covering the stories that are important to their readers, uh, their viewers, and their listeners. Um, so COVID was, was the story. Uh, they needed to be doing that, they needed to be covering it. Um, and, and as I said earlier, now, now the scope of what they're covering is broadening. Um, but to get back to the question of the veracity of the information that you're getting, um, you know, what I try to emphasize with, with everyone, but clients as well, is that you need to, the, the media is important. You know, some people say, we don't need the media anymore. You've got social media. Um, my message back is always that you need those trusted sources, the people who have got the training, who do the research, who get the facts correct. And regardless of where you get your news from, whether it be from Facebook, from YouTube, um, you, you need to uh, discover the source of that information. Uh, if, if you trace back a Facebook post to CBC Daybreak, you know, that, that I, in my mind is a trusted source of information. Uh, there's, there's a lot of other sources that aren't, aren't as trusted. Um, the, the paradox, you know, in, in today's world is that because we're all sitting in our home offices uh, on computer screens all day, that people are consuming media in far greater numbers than they, than they ever have. Um, I saw a study recently that said uh, cable news viewership is up, uh, it's double what it was pr prior to the pandemic. Uh, New York Times subscriptions have spiked. Um, but on the flip side, Twitter traffic has increased by 23%. Um, I don't know if you watched the premier's, or the, sorry, the prime minister's daily updates in early, early days of COVID. Um, you know, he was broadcasting daily on, on broadcast news. Uh, but if you went to YouTube, uh, his daily updates were getting a million views a day on, on YouTube, um, which is fine if those broadcasts are coming from CTV, uh, from CBC. Um, but what you need to be doing always is, is going back to the source and, and, and trying to decide if that information is credible. So I'm going to cover a few uh, points and then whoever wants to jump in can jump in just sensitive to time. I probably won't be able to get a response from all of you, but uh, those that want to jump in, jump in. And, and I want to first begin with a question that came in. It's an interesting one from Jennifer. She, she uh, says, in terms of getting local expertise and diversity of perspectives, in what ways are you proactively reaching out uh, to the community? And, and, and I guess it's broadly because you know, if there are less advertising dollars, there's less resources to pay for people. If you have less people, uh, how do you actually get out there and access that and get a broad perspective so that there's a clearer picture? And maybe that's to, to Doris and Chris, but it's maybe the answer is we got to deal more with Chris and with uh, Cam and, and be a little more sophisticated on the other side. So any response to that question? Well, I, uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, just quickly, um, yeah, it's harder now, um, you know, but, the, you know, phones still work. And the best, I mean, in my view, the best question that you can ask at the end of a phone call uh, conversation is, is there, is there someone else I should talk to? Who do you know who knows more about this than either of us? Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to maybe blame the pandemic, but, um, uh, you know, those sources are out there. It, it is harder to find them because you're not bumping into people. You're not having those conversations at parties or, at, you know, cocktail parties or at, at chamber luncheons. You're not having those casual conversations around a table before the event gets going. So yeah, some of that sourcing is, is harder. Uh, that's where Cam and Chris come in because they can, they can uh, get those people in front of us. Uh, but Doris, over to you. You're right, it is getting difficult. And uh, a simple Google search sometimes of Kelowna and the subject and 
you know, looking for someone in the area, you, you need to have um, a solid web searchable, um, you know, presence on the internet that tells us who you are, where you are, how you're accessible. Um, there was a story, uh, it happens to be the biggest story on our website, Ogopogo. Um, people around the world love the legend of Ogopogo and it gets us a million hits no matter when we do the story. It's great. There's an expert down in Indiana and I had touched base with him about the Shuswagi and the shoe swap last year and last year he didn't get my email till two days later but this time he was set up on Zoom. I emailed him again. He was available in 15 minutes set up. We did the interview and had our reporter on it. And that kind of availability where, you know, when there's interest in your expertise, your knowledge that I can search, or you've sent me an email to touch base, someone in our organization, because yes, there are times that you can see the newsroom behind me. I'm answering the phones here in the newsroom. I'm researching, I'm doing court checks. I'm talking to our reporters in the field, producing my newscast, and then I'm in the studio. We are doing more than ever, each individual of us here, but our job is still to get the stories across, and I'd love to be able to see your information, whoever you are in the Chamber of Commerce, available at a moment's notice that I can get you as part of our story. I wonder, uh, uh, we had a, a question that uh, came in about uh, any advice you could give um, to particular organizations to get uh, their information out. But I, I'm going to just take that and build on it a bit and maybe yield to, to Chris Olson and, and Cam, but others, if, if you want to jump in with respect to, um, you know, the challenges that businesses are facing with, um, you know, particularly in light of COVID and less revenue is where do you spend your advertising dollars? How do you get your message out? And the standby, and we've, we've seen it, and in fact, we participate the most, the cheapest when you have a small budget is through social media, but you want to invest in the local. And so, you know, my advice for a couple nonprofits, and we've got about 100 nonprofits that are members of the chamber, don't beat yourself up for buying a Facebook ad, but it's an illustration of uh, the environment that we're in and that the media is in, that that structure exists and developed almost unregulated. And now the consequence we're feeling on the local side. Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, any advice you would give small organizations of, and, and in particular in the Kelowna area where it's really highly competitive uh, from a media perspective, what advice uh, aside from saying spend with us, maybe Chris and, and Cam, what advice do you give a small business or a nonprofit that is trying to get their message out there. Where, how, to, how best to do that and divide what limited dollars they might have? Well, uh, I would say from an advertising point of view, Dan, I mean, I think you have to, you've got a budget. And uh, by the way, I was not trained in the media. I was trained in accounting and finance. So this is kind of my area. <laughs> I would say that, you know, you, you allocate your budget to what gives you the biggest bang for the buck. And if it happens to be social media, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. That's the way it is today, um, but it might be local radio. You have to determine who your audience is. And I, I did radio sales for a while and in one of my earlier jobs. And I know that one of the problems a client would have actually is they advertise with us and we gave them a very good rate, uh, but they got too much business because they just were swamped with that. So again, it's, I don't think social media, I don't think you should feel guilty about it. You should go where you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. And it might be television, it might be local radio, it might be something on Castanet or, or what have you. Um, but also don't forget about public relations too, because another way to get um, uh, um, known is to do a story the media wants. One of the reasons people, uh, uh, businesses don't get in the news is they don't tell anybody their story. Um, and the other thing is they, when they try to tell uh, Doris or, or Chris Walker uh, their story, they make it sound like an ad and not a news story. So there are techniques that you can use that you can get the uh, publicity you want without buying an ad, but making, but giving uh, uh, Doris and Chris what they need, which is a really good story and one that is important to their uh, listeners and viewers. 
Excellent. Thanks, Chris. And, and that's our free plug for the next uh, uh, Business Smart series we'll do with uh, a couple of you to help businesses understand that kind of structure and building that uh, advertising kind of and promotional uh, program. So that's great. Thanks for that response. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to make an observation. And I've repeated this a couple of times when we've had uh, WorkSafe BC officials on board and we get you know, feedback from some businesses. I want the absolute rule. What is exactly, tell me exactly what you're, you're doing and put the regulations in place. And we've had to remind them as the Chamber of Commerce, we spend our life telling government not to regulate us. We want less regulation. So if these are guidelines. And for the most part, the government of British Columbia has done a pretty good job in communicating those guidelines, works APC, as long as people follow them. Um, but it uh, poses, you know, the challenge that we have, and even from consumers, do you really want more regulations? Um, and some people, oh yeah, that's right, we, we don't want that. Do we need regulations and more regulations in the media world, in the broadcast or print? Um, and there, I'll preface that with some discussion that's now occurring at the national level with respect to regulations around Facebook and revenue sharing that may flow back to uh, help small entities uh, and the development of journalism, particularly in small communities, but right across. Do you think there needs to be, uh, and is that a worthy conversation nationally to be occurring to put greater restrictions on, on Facebook and maybe have some of that revenue flow back to help fund and keep uh, journalism in small communities still alive? Big question. Doris? back into my court because of course um, our parent company chorus has now begun you know publicly lobbying to be part of that revenue dollar that's gone south and you have to remember these social media companies are owned outside of canada uh, so it has taken away revenues directly from your local community we have you know the newspaper here has I believe two or three reporters now, it's really quite sad. Um, and uh, who's actually writing your local story? That's been an issue, you know, as long as they've been able to have someone outside of the country write the story. But uh, regulations, uh, that's a very political charged question for me. But uh, we, uh, Chris and I, Chris Walker and I, both um, CBC, CTV, uh, global news we participate in the Canadian broadcast standards and we actually do um, have a body that governs what we say what we show um, the tone of our stories and the tone of our uh, even advertising in the middle of our messaging so we are very accountable uh, <laughs> there are internet internet based um, you know companies that have no uh, governing body and they're their standards of excellence are not the same as ours, and we see it, but uh, we just continue again to uh, remember that integrity, um, history, longevity, uh, we've been in the community, we've been in this country, we know how to do things right, and we're just going to stay the course. If I can jump in, uh, uh, I, a couple of thoughts here. I think, Dan, you really asked two questions. One is about the regulation of media, and this is something I feel very strongly about. Regulation of media is not a good idea. Um, we, as, as reporters, must be free to examine and hold power accountable. It's a key role in a, of media in a democracy. Um, so regulation of media per se, and as Doris mentioned, there are internal, very strict uh, governance structures that'll, that ensure that we are held to a high professional standard. The other thing you brought up was essentially what you're, what you're talking about is an antitrust movement against yeah. social media companies. That's a separate question, um, but media has, is in a real bind right now because we're, we've, we've defaulted to social media as the main platform for the delivery of our content and we're in a Faustian bargain with social media where it, we, in many ways social media works against the raison d'etre of journalism, which is to inform the public. And yet in comment sections, the exact opposite happens. And yet the, the divisiveness and the, the clickbait 
drives revenue. So there's a real paradox, a real problem here around uh, internet governance that uh, I'll leave it to people with bigger paychecks to figure out. Yeah, it's, it, it's a fascinating subject and I wish we had about four more hours to, <laughs> to go deep and I am uh, sensitive and also appreciative of the time that you've given up. Uh, I will say, and I, I mentioned to Doris, I think, uh, before we began, if you haven't watched Social Dilemma on uh, Netflix, it should be mandatory watching. Uh, and Chris, something you said around polarization, are we actually more polarized or do we now have media that actually capitalizes on accelerating the polarization for the benefits of those that like divided groups? And even when you look at, I'll make the observation in the United States, because it's just easier where we are to, to make that comparison, you have politicians that are using the media to reach directly to their target audience. And um, so they don't actually, they're the ones in charge of regulating, but why would you regulate something that you're benefiting from? So they're in that uh, quandary of, you know, being asked and they bring them uh, to Congress, but uh, nothing really changes. So it's an interesting area. I want to go a little deeper, but not today on. I want to close with, with just posing uh, from your perspectives, uh, to Doris and to Chris, what stories are not getting the attention they deserve during this time? Uh, or to, to Chris Olson or Cam, uh, what do you think the media should be focusing more on from your perspective and with the clients and the customers that you deal with? Anybody want to jump in? Well, I would say, you know, I, I think it's going to change over, over time. But uh, one of the... Um, one of the things we haven't really focused on is the future because COVID has made us focus on today and saving lives today or maybe getting through the winter. Uh, maybe the programs will keep businesses going till the summer, but, but that longer term view, and I think that will come, maybe this local provincial election will get that focus uh, because it, it wouldn't have mattered what party was in BC, the government would have treated COVID-19 exactly the same. I don't think the public realizes that, but that's what would have happened. There would have been no difference whether Greens, Liberals, or, or NDP are in. But what will be different is how we deal with the aftermath of COVID and how the province uh, goes forward from there. I think that's the discussion that hasn't happened yet. It may still be a little early, but I think we're starting to see some signs of that. And, and that focus on the future and getting the positivity back in, in British Columbia and Canada and the world that we're going to get through this and uh, and where we go from here. What what Canada do we want? What British Columbia do we want? And that is the discussion I think that will happen. I, I had one more question I'm gonna squeeze in just uh, sensitive to time. Uh, it's an interesting one is the, the question comes in from someone that's, that's joined us today about, uh, is it reasonable for reporters to express an opinion while covering a story? Um, and I'll yield to Doris and Chris, and, uh, but I'll make the observation because I know even in my household, if you watch CNN and Fox News, and I watch both, <laughs> uh, when they shift from a newscast to their commentator, it's not always clear that you're moving from one venue to the other. And Chris, you kind of you do this because uh, with respect to part of your role as a host is being a host, right? Um, so, and you've got probably one of the, uh, you know, the strongest backgrounds as a master's in journalism but there is a difference between your newscast and that. So if you could just, Doris and, and Chris, is it just awareness people need to be when they're watching that you're not actually paying attention to a journalist and a newscast, you're watching a, a program and a host. Do we need to be better yeah. educated in that area, Doris? We've talked a little bit today about media literacy. Um, and I'd like to think, because I've got several children, uh, adults down to five years old and, and it's not just a generational thing. It's because, again, we have so much American uh, messaging. I'm not even going to call it media. It's just American messaging. It's, it's infotainment. It's entertainment. Sometimes it's news. And it has come into our homes uh, since I was a young woman uh, here in Canada. So it, it, it's difficult for Canadian public to get Canadian messaging um, and proper navigation of, of the media world. Uh, they're, they're also looking at American media and casting that shadow on us here in Canada. We don't have the availability of programming uh, with information and news as they do in the States. 
and, and the money that drives that. Uh, it's, it's people emailing me messaging that saying, is this real? I'm looking and I'm telling them, look at the source. And I'm thinking that these people would understand that the source of the information is fake, but people beyond my age, um, you know, believe anything that comes into their inbox. And it's unfortunate. Um, it's definitely something that we can teach people in the next generation. It, it's, it's a very difficult time to understand media literacy. If I can, if I may yeah. just jump Great. in quickly, uh, uh, just yeah. two quick observations. Um, there is uh, sometimes, conf this goes to the media literacy thing, there is sometimes confusion as to what, uh, what is opinion and what is fact. If I tell you that, that uh, human burning of fossil fuels causes climate change, that's a fact. That's not an opinion. Mm -hmm. Some people interpret that as an opinion. It's not, it's a fact. Um, you know, and, and the second part of that is, is that opinion has always been part of journalism. Opinion is part of journalism. Editorials, columnists, opinion is part of the journalism milieu. Now, to the question, should a reporter express an opinion during a news report? Well, the answer is no. But that doesn't mean that there can't be opinion in journalism and, and it behooves us all to, to work on media literacy with ourselves, our family, our kids, so that people understand what, as to your point, Dan, what they're, what they're looking at. Uh, Chris, thanks for that. And Doris as well. It's a great way to wrap things up on that information. And I'm respectful of uh, all your time and those that have joined us. I'm going to turn things over as we wrap things up to... Uh, uh, Chamber Vice President Dan Price, who's joined us on screen to, to just provide thank yous. Dan? Hello, everybody. Hey, great discussion today. Really enjoyable. Uh, it's my pleasure today to acknowledge and thank our guest panelists, Doris, Chris, Chris, and Cam. Thank you for providing your insights and perspectives, and we certainly appreciate your expertise. As we all navigate the short and long-term impacts of COVID-19, your insights will help us gain a better understanding of interacting with your busy schedules to speak with us. Now, some time ago, we shifted away from providing a speaker gift, and instead, we will be making a small donation to a local charity on your behalf. So this month's benefactor is the Okanagan Pride Society. So great choice, and thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for, for joining us as well and hanging in to the end. Uh, we have gone a little bit longer, but thanks to all the attendees. Uh, uh, reminder, our next session is on October 27th. It's a Tuesday as we uh, kind of mark National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Uh, that'll occur just uh, uh, after Small Business Week, which we have lots of plans for. Uh, Doris, Chris, Chris Walker, uh, Cam McAlpine, thanks to all of you again for joining us and, and have a great day and a wonderful weekend. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone.